It's always nice to hear that you're a magnificent speaker before you've ever even said anything. So maybe we can just shut down now and we'll all go home. <laughs> and speaking of large beekeepers in Manitoba, it's only fitting that we get the smallest guy going first here. I want to do a bit of a background on our beekeeping operation. And a lot of the background has been given in the introduction. Um, we want to talk about managing hives and labor for honey um, queen and new production. Before I go on, can you hear me in the back? Can you give me a wave if everything's okay? Good. Um, we're a small time operation, so there's not too much to be said about the labor aspect. So we'll do a bit about labor and then mostly about the other topics. A bit of background for, of our apiary. Um, we run under 50 hives for honey production, around 45-ish or so. Raise a few hundred queens for sale every year for our own operation, for our nooks. And uh, then we also raise around 50 to 75 nooks to replace our dead stock and uh, grow and to also sell whatever we have left over. Typically our full hives are wintered outside. We winter our nooks inside in three, four, five, and six frame configuration. We don't quite, we haven't quite decided which we like best. <clears throat> and as Brett said, we're a small operation, part of Waldheim community. Um, we share all financial benefits, but that also has an additional benefit in that we can share equipment. We don't have to own any of the heavy equipment, trucks and trailers to haul bees or anything like that. So we just share between the different industries in the community. So in terms of equipment uh, for extracting, we have a small 32 frame data and manual or automatic advanced extractor. Um, we have a silver queen on capper. Junior wax spinner to <coughs> excuse me. A junior wax spinner to remove the, the honey from the cappings. Um, we have a heated sump to warm the honey, heated holding tanks, bee blower for our last uh, honey pull, and then also a very important part of our operation is the super cart to haul around the boxes and the equipment. Um, in the back here you have uh, my father feeding the capper, and this is my aunt Helen. She's also part of the extracting crew. In terms of labor, I was able to fit it all onto one page, so <laughs> here we go. Um, typically, we only get extra help for extracting, so we have uh, that happening four or five days in the year. Um, I have my dad, he's here, and my uncle Tim in the back, and then my mom, uh, Betty, and her sister Helen, they help with the extracting days. Um, most of the other work I, I do by myself. We, we extract around maximum 5,000 pounds a day. Um, we filter it and store it away the same day. But the last two years we've been starting to fill drums because we find it easier to liquefy the honey in the drums uh, and pump and move it around uh, when we're doing creaming. So times are changing a bit. That's basically our, our labor aspect. Now I want to spend a bit more time in our philosophy around managing for honey production. <clears throat> and before I get into that too, uh, too far, I'd like you all to take a, a couple of seconds to think about this question. When in your apiary or when in your bees do you start preparing for a good honey crop? And I'll give you 20 seconds and then I want a few shout outs. When do you prepare for a good honey crop? <clears throat> Any other suggestions? August. I just August? August. Of, of the previous year, obviously. Obviously. Yeah. Okay. Any other suggestions? <clears throat> so none of you ever prepare for a good honey crop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Magic happened. <laughs> and so we have an answer of planting time, and we have an answer in, in August, and the others don't prepare. <laughs> so here's a bit of our philosophy. We believe that we prepare the previous summer. It's very important to get the hives into shape the previous summer in order to have a good honey crop the next year. Um, we have quite a few different aspects to look at, uh, principally being making sure the hives are disease free and the mites are under control. We have to make sure our brew diseases are also, if there's any present, that they're being treated and looked after. Um, before I go on about the brew diseases, a lot of the treatments can't be used when the honey supers are on, so that has to be looked after even before the summer. 
Um, we have to make sure that we have good young queens in the hives that are vigorous. Usually we have heard anecdotally that the queens in their second year are the most vigorous and are able to build up the strongest hives. And then we have to make sure that our hives are thriving, healthy and building up strong. I want to make a special point about the varroa mites. Um, if we have um, hives that come through the winter and they're not treated, and if we look at April the 1st as a, as a, as a good time to look at the mite levels in our hives, and typically, not typically, but we've seen 1% infestation in the hives around April 1st, and that's based on old data. It's still relevant though, but if we look here around April 1st and we have this 1% mite levels, and they're not looked after, then this is what our mite levels will look like in the fall. Um, this model is based on Randy Oliver's Varroa model and, and hive growth. And then I'm, I also use some information from Mr. Curry's uh, comparisons between screen bottom board counts and, uh, and uh, alcohol wash. So my, my point I want to make here is that if we have a low level in, the, in April 1, and we just let that hive fend for itself, by the time we get to fall, that hive is nearing breakdown status around October. We really like to do a midsummer knockdown. And because we're a small apiary, we can experiment with different ways of doing that. In the past, we've used the icing sugar, uh, the icing sugar dusting method. You can use drone brood removal. And uh, there's also a few uh, different varroacides that are registered for honey soup while for use while honey supers are on the hives and one of them being formic acid mitoway quick strips. If you take a look at a 60% drop here, if you put a treatment in it's even moderately effective 60%, that really impacts your fall uh, varroa levels. Additionally, if you have a 90% efficacy in whatever treatment you're doing around the 1st of June, then your mites levels are really low in the fall. And I'll speak more about the impact this early or mid midsummer treatment has on winter survivability and how well your hives are doing in the springtime. So just keep this in mind. Uh, we firmly believe in the midsummer knockdown to get the levels uh, down to where they should be. So going on to managing for honey production, that was the previous summer, now we're going into the fall. How do we make sure we have strong hives? How do we make sure our hives look good in the springtime? <clears throat> Two emphasis I want to do with this presentation, and one of them is underlined here in nutrition, and the second one I've spoken briefly about, and that's mite control. Um, we typically like to get around 25 liters of sucrose into each hive, um, and uh, we do that by open feeding with totes. And we've tried to do that in the last few years, we're getting into more and more open feeding. It's a lot easier than putting a gallon or two on top of every hive, and the strong hives get whatever they need, and the weaker hives don't need as much. So they don't take as much. We find it's also very important to get some pollen patties onto the hives in the fall. Um, up to three pounds our strongest hives will consume from mid-August onward. Um, again, emphasizing disease control, making sure your mites are, mite levels are under control, and then also looking after any brood diseases or any problems that might arise from that. Uh, a bit of an emphasis on, on uh, nutrition. And, and fall practices that I've been noticing in Manitoba, especially now when our agriculture is becoming monocultural and our alfalfa fields are disappearing. We have the nice flow coming in from canola, and then that stops around mid-August, sometimes even earlier. And then sometimes you see beekeepers that don't pull their honey until about mid-September. This means that there's a one-month window there where there's virtually no nutrition going into that hive. The queen and egg laying rapidly decrease, and your population, the, those old bees that have brought in the honey crop, are now quickly dying off. And, and we've seen quite a few hives that are just collapsed, only a handful of bees and the queen there in the fall. And then, when you do tests on these bees that are left over, the varroa levels are astonishingly high because they're so concentrated. So. What we try to do is to make sure that we feed the hives, we keep that queen brooding um, for the next maybe month or so to keep the hives strong so that they can do better during the winter time. Additionally, the late feeding start. If, if, if we have last honey coming in in mid-August 
and we have the first feeding mid-September, one month where that hive is getting no food. So I really want to emphasize this point here. And, and we can see, for many of you will remember a few years back when we had this dry fall, where there was no pollen coming in, there was no honey flow, and guess what, next spring the bee price was really high because everybody was looking for bees. Um, a lot of them had died during the winter. So I'm, I'm curious to see how, how this, this theory will, will play itself out over the next few years. We had another dry fall in our area this past year, so we'll see what happens in the springtime. So going from the fall into the winter, we try and have our hives wrapped uh, around mid-November, mid beginning of December, depending on the year and the weather. And the daytime temperatures are around zero. Nighttime temperatures are around 10. We want to send the queen and that hive a message that it's winter time, stop laying. It's time to get into wintering mode. Um, we overwinter our hives as singles outside. Uh, in some years we have huge, huge hives, and so we leave them in two boxes. And they're wet, wrapped with a, a bee cozy winter wraps and the one inch insulation on top. And my batteries have run dry. So then, we get into springtime, and this is the time about within the next month we'll be getting into the topic on this slide. Again, it's crucial to look after your nutrition and feeding in the spring. Um, I want to talk a bit about the energy levels and how do we know if a hive has enough syrup. Once again, pointing over to Randy Oliver and also to Mr. Stepper's blog about having the larvae swimming in the white jelly, then you know that your hive is receiving the nutrition it's supposed to be getting. Um, again, open feeding with totes allows you to put a, a, a glug of feed in whenever it's needed, and it's quite, the, the work is quite minimal. Um, in terms of pollen supplement, we try and get our first patties on around mid-March, mid-end of March, and, uh, and for the last few years we've tried to keep that supplement there until the canola bloom starts. And for some of you, you might wonder why if we have this wonderful dandelion flow and willows and all of that stuff, do we have to keep pollen on the hives? Well, the truth is, is that many times we have this inclement weather where we have a nice flow in, in, in the beginning of April, but then we have two or three weeks of rain and there's nothing coming in. And the bees, if they're in the brooding period, they rapidly consume whatever was there. So this helps us keep these hives growing and keeping them strong for the honey flow. How do we keep our, how do we manage our hives and our boxes for the summer? As mentioned before, our hives come out of the winter as singles. So as soon as the single box fills up fully with bees and brood and it's time to put the second box on, we add it and let the queen lay in both boxes. Um, there's discussion about whether to add it on the bottom versus on the top and we've always added it on the top, the box. But now I think this year we might want to try adding it to the bottom because and the benefit for that is, is that heat rises and so if the brood is on the top, in the top box, the, the heat is sort of kept there by the insulated lid, whereas if it's on the bottom, the heat sort of escapes up into the empty box. So adding it on the, adding the empty box on the bottom allows the bees room for honey storage if there's anything coming in and for bee storage if you have lots of extra bees in the hive without having to compromise on giving up heat for that. Um, we like to keep our hives unwrapped, or sorry, we like to keep our hives wrapped as long as possible um, because of our inclement weather. Uh, a lot of times we have our first cleansing flights in, in mid-March, and then a lot of times we see that the, the bigger beekeepers move their bees out into, uh, into the, their holding yards at the beginning of April, but then a week or two later you see four inches of snow on the lids, and you always wonder, how is that hive doing or taking that, having to rear brood and keep the core temperature at 90 degrees Fahrenheit and still have all that weather thrown at it. So try and keep them wrapped as long as possible. Um, as soon as we have to add the third box, though, we have to take the wraps off. So before the honey flow, when the queen has laid in both boxes and had lots of brew there, we confine the queen to the bottom and we put an excluder in. Now, the second box where this brood was, is going to be hatching and the bees will be filling with honey for extraction and then we also add the third box and proceed with our bee year. Uh, we typically look through the hives every 10 days um, for disease, for queen performance, 
uh, for swarming cells, and I know for a lot of big beekeepers that isn't practical, but for us it allows us to, to micromanage and, and to take full advantage of the hives. So what we do every 10 days, we'll take a frame or two of fresh brood and move it from the root chamber above the excluder to give the queen a bit more room to lay in and also to try and um, help draw the bees through the excluder. So that's basically our year in a nutshell. Now I want to briefly talk about two additional topics that didn't easily fit into any of the previous <coughs> slides. Number one is drawing out frames, how we've historically done it and then how <coughs> we're finding a better way. So what we've done in the past is we've added a, a 10 frame box right above the, the brood chamber and allow the queen to lay into it and if there's a good honey flow coming in and the hive is strong that box is drawn out in a week those bees are rapidly drawing the wax out but now there's also different ways of adding frames to the honey supers in positions two and seven if you're running nine fra frames and they also do a marvelous job of drawing out the, the frames we want to make sure that we cycle about 10 percent of our frames every year so that um, theoretically none of our frames are older than 10 years in the brood chamber and in the honey supers, just to keep the equipment new and, and it looks good and it's nice to work with. The other topic is removing honey for extraction. So if we don't have the expensive equipment and the one-way traps, the first few extractions, we can just set the boxes out on the ends and the bees will fly out. If you do that early in the morning and it's a nice warm day, they'll all be gone by four o'clock. But then our final extraction, we have to actually blow the bees out or use bee escapes because they're just, they don't want to give up their last honey. So that's basically our honey year. The other two topics is queen rearing. So I just want to briefly talk about that because it's something we also do. So to raise good queens, we need drones, warm flying weather and a good queen mother. Uh, the drones are to mate the queen. The flying weather is so that this can actually occur. And to have a good queen mother, we don't want to be making more junk. So we want to make sure we're raising good queens. Um, typically, we start grafting uh, in the beginning of May, although sometimes the weather will push us into the beginning of June. And we'll graft all the way through to August, mid-August. We usually graft our cells and then move them into the queenless cell starters, which are some really strong four or five frame nooks that are queenless. Um, we, and then once the cells are 24 to 36 uh, hours old, if they've had a good start, we move them into queen right cell finishers. So we'll take our honey producing hives and move two frames of fresh brood into the top box um, and then put the cells between them. We want to make sure that, uh, especially in the early couple of rounds of queen rearing, that we keep the hives fed with both uh, sugar and protein because, again, of the inclement weather that we sometimes experience in the springtime. The, the queen starters, they get sugar water and, uh, and, bee, and, a, bee pa and a pollen patty, but the, the cell finishers, because they're actually honey supers, we take a 50% honey and a 50% water mixture so that we don't adulterate the honey. Once the cells are finished, we move them into an incubator until they're about a day or two from hatching. From there, we uh, move the cells into mating nooks and we've, we use three frame, full frame nooks and uh, also the mini mating nooks that, that you see around. There's advantages and disadvantages to both of them. For the three frame uh, full hive, uh, mating nooks, we basically take a, a standard hive body and cut it into three parts, not cut, but put three partitions in, and then have three frames in each with holes going the opposite ways. Uh, the beauty of this system is that it allows you to interchange your equipment. You don't have to worry about having little frames and big frames, and they're easily stopped by just taking a, a frame of bees and brood from any of your regular hives. The disadvantage though for, for this setup is that it requires quite a bit of resources to set up. You need quite, you need, if you want to set up 75 nukes, you have to set up 75, you have to get 75 frames of brood and bees from somewhere. Um, the mini mating nukes require quite, quite a few, quite a lot fewer resources, so they require only about a cup of bees, so not too much there. The problem with those though is, is that if there is no honey coming in, they quickly, they go, quickly go hungry. And if there's honey coming in, they quickly uh, 
fill up, fill up and plug, and then what do you do with all these little frames of honey? They make nice gifts, but <laughs> there's a limited amount of, of what you can give away. Um, the queens are introduced as cells or virgin queens into these mating nooks. Uh, cells are ideal, but we've also introduced virgin queens quite successfully by spraying all the bees in the little mating nook with uh, sugar, water, and honeybee healthy mixture and then throwing the virgin queen in and also uh, spraying her with that. And that masks the scent for a day or two or however long it takes. And then you come back and there's a beautiful laying queen there. For anybody just getting into queen, uh, queen rearing, I just want to give a word of caution here. And I, I'm talking from experience. It's, it's always wonderful to watch every, st every step of the way. You want to see the queen every day. You want to open the meeting nook and see, oh, that she's growing and she's getting bigger and now she has the meeting sign. But very often you'll find if you do that, uh, you'll find a nice ball of bees in, on the bottom of your meeting nooks and you'll wonder what the heck's going on here and you'll poke around a bit and you'll see the virgin queen being killed there or suffocated or whatever it is. And you'll think, well, it must be a dart. That's why, there's, that's why they're killing the virgin queen or maybe a different virgin queen got into that hive, but that's really not the case. The problem here is, is that we're disturbing the mating nooks too much. We just need to keep our hands off. We have a hard and fast rule of 14 days, and you come back and then you see the queen there in fresh larvae. So maybe have a couple on the side you want to experiment with, but if, you're, if you want to really get into it, just they'll do everything on their own. They're, they're designed that way. A bit about nuke production. Um, when we produce our nooks, we typically do it uh, every year when we get our, fir our first queens in. We um, can also do it with cells or with a fresh queen. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have three, four, and five frame nooks. The three frame nooks are mostly overwintered for queen rearing so that we don't have to make them up every year again. And so we just take out frames or brood as needed and then put the fresh queen in. Um, the four and five and sixers, we, we take typically two frames with bees and brood or one nice full frame of brood and then a good shake of bees. You want to make sure that whatever brood you put into those hives, the bees are able to keep it warm and prevent it from, from dying. Uh, we add a cell or a fresh queen in, in a cage, of course, and then uh, we add a, uh, the rest with drawn comb, so with built out wax. I've also found that if you had a frame with foundation, the bees will rapidly build that out because if you have just uh, kept brew there and your new queen won't start laying for a week or two, she, stuck, she hatches and these bees right away know it's time to make some room and they draw off that frame very rapidly. We move them a few miles away so that we don't have any drifting or any bees going back to the original hives. And then once again, our two week rule, don't touch it for two weeks. And then once you come back, you can see that there's a fresh larvae and the queen's doing really well. If everything's settled in the nukes, then we can push two of them together, or in the case of the six frame nukes from Lewis, you can push three of them together and then put queen excluders on top, and then have your bees bringing you a box or two of honey out of those. Just be careful though that you make sure the queen excluders are nice and flat on the box, as you don't want them, the queens to be crossing over into the other and nukes and killing each other off. So it, it, we, we've done it quite a few times and there you can see in the springtime our bees are repped or the little nukes repped and getting ready to grow. That's our year and basically next year you go into it all over again. It works really well for us. So thank you very much for your attention and there is my Uncle Tim wishing you a good beekeeping year.